Hi, good evening all. Uh, today, April 19th is World Liver Disease Liver Day. So the Perindalmana ONG Society is happy to host an academic program on liver diseases complicating pregnancy. For this CME to inaugurate, we have our Honorable President of Kerala Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Dr. Ajit, and we have a senior faculty from uh, Muscat, uh, Dr. Ashik. He's a gastroenterologist. And we have uh, Dr. Premila, the uh, secretary of Trishur ONG Society. So on behalf of uh, Perindalmanna ONG Society, I would, I would like to welcome all of you, all the faculty, all the delegates who are attending this uh, CME uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, with these few words, I would like to introduce our chief guest and the faculty. So I'm just sharing my screen. Uh, Dr. Ajit is the chief guest and uh, the person who is going to inaugurate as well as moderate this uh, today's webinar. And uh, Dr. Ajit is the professor and head of the department of ONG at uh, Government Medical College, Kannur. And he's the present president of Kerala Federation of ONG. And uh, he was the past vice president and joint secretary of KFOG, also the past chairperson of research committee of KFO. And uh, he has served uh, uh, two years as the uh, president of Kannur ONG Society in the past year. And uh, we have Dr. Ashik Senu. He is the gastroenterologist. He had he is a senior consultant, interventional gastroenterologist, and medical director, Aster Hospital, Muscat, Oman. Uh, since uh, 2011, and he has started the first therapeutic ERCP service in the private sector in Oman, and started the first uh, EUS service in the private sector in Oman. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Ashik, it is uh, esophageal ultrasound. Am I correct? And uh, he had his MBBS in 1998 uh, from JIPMA and MD in general medicine from Coimbatore Medical College and DM gastroenterology from Government Medical College, Calicut. And he had his MRCP in 2005, uh, specialist training in uh, 2009, and FRCP in 2017. He has almost 13 publications in the index journals to his credit. And uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Premila Menon, uh, who is the professor, Department of ONG, Amala Medical College, Trishur. And the, uh, uh, Dr. Premila is also the secretary of Trishur ONG Society and past editor of the KFOG journal. And she is the past treasurer of the Chur ONG Society. And uh, uh, she was awarded with Kamini Rao Oration in the year 2017, and also the uh, prize winner of UA All-Rounder uh, All in UA Foxy. And she has special interest in gynae oncology and high-risk pregnancy. And uh, I'm very happy to say that all the three, the chief guests, the fa all the faculty, all are very good friends of uh, mine in person, as well as the uh, well wishes of uh, Piridalmana ONG Society. With these uh, few words, I would li like to invite our chief guest, uh, Dr. Ajit, to inaugurate the CME, as well as uh, to take over the moderation. Over to Dr. Ajit. Good evening, all respected seniors, dear friends. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, the President of uh, Karindarman Society, Dr. Kunyamoyedin, Secretary, Dr. Wahab, for giving me this opportunity. And actually, it is my first official uh, function after taking on as the KFOG. Again, coming to the, the Pendulum Society, we have seen how active it was in the last year. A lot of webinars, very active, concernedly, socially also. There are also a lot of social programs. So, again, to involve with such a wonderful society is a very happy thing for me and for the KFOG. And today's session, we have two eminent faculties, uh, Dr. Sainu and Dr. Pamela to discuss on one of the very important topics, the liver disorders in pregnancy. And I remember when we were doing post-graduation in Toronto Medical College, actually it was the commonest cause of maternal mortality. And 
uh, I agree that uh, we could reduce the morbidity and mortality very much uh, by the, the active intervention now, but it was, uh, again, a, it is a, a nightmare for all the obstetricians in, all over the world. And for the, the discussion, I think first uh, Dr. Premila or Dr. Stein, who is going to uh, first, Dr. Premila, she'll be speaking on obstetrician's dilemmas. Okay. Or to Dr. Premila. Let me share my screen. Dr. Ashik, we are keeping the obstetrician stock first because uh, you can also address the issues uh, which is she is raising up. I think Dr. Premila, you can first open it and uh, minimize. Uh, I had actually kept it open uh, and I had tried for sharing also. At that time, it worked. Um, just let me see. A tray of One minute. I don't know why now it is not opening. Uh, is it okay now? <laughs> Some problem is actually initially when I joined, I tried screen sharing. Then we At can... that time, there was no problem. Ashik, you are ready now. I know. I think it is now okay. Just one minute, sir. Yeah. One minute. Can you see? Ah, yes, it is. Yes. You can do the slideshow. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, very good evening to all. Uh, First of all, uh, thank I thank Kunyuddin sir, Wahab sir, and the whole team of Fox for giving this opportunity. It indeed is a, a great a pleasure to join Fox. Fox and Fox are like bhai bhai, <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, very good evening to our uh, KFOC president and uh, the speaker of the day, Dr. Ashik. So without wasting time, let us go through this uh, topic of the huge, it's a huge topic, but we'll be just touching upon the important obstetric challenges that we as obstetricians face in managing a liver disease. Uh, we all know uh, only a few number of pregnancies might be affected by liver disease, but it contributes to significant maternal mortality. 
as sir said just now, a lot of cases of maternal mortality they used to see in Sri Lanka Medical College. Even now, there are maternal mortality cases are there. And if you look into the last 10 years uh, statistics, actually almost 70 deaths were there due to liver disease. And as expected, most of these cases were either due to health syndrome or due to AFLP and a small proportion also due to viral hepatitis. And when you look into the counterpart, that is the near miss audit, there's a huge number of cases which due to prompt management could be saved. And when you look into these patients, we see that the key is the early diagnosis. And I think as an obstetrician, that is the most important challenge for us, making an early diagnosis. Why this is difficult? Because many changes of the uh, pregnancy actually mimic the liver disease, like uh, your spider angioma, palmar arrhythmia, which can be there due to uh, hyperestrogenism. Examination of liver becomes a little difficult because of progesterone, the gallbladder mortality decreases, estrogen will supersaturate the bile with cholesterol, all will increase the chances of biliary diseases, lipid profile abnormalities is a normal in pregnancy, cholesterol and triglyceride are normally raised in pregnancy. And when you look into the uh, blood parameters, actually uh, most of the blood parameters doesn't change in pregnancy, but the main two things that you have to be uh, uh, looking is the alkaline phosphatase and albumin. And we all know alkaline phosphatase because of the placental alkaline phosphatase is going to be elevated up to four times the value is normal. And I'm sure almost all of you would have got a call at 12 o'clock at the night from your house surgeon or somebody in the ward saying the report is showing elevated alkaline phosphatase. Uh, but that we know that unless it is more than 600, you don't have to get worried about that. Similarly, albumin, because of the hemodilution, albumin levels are going to be little less. But other than that, the other liver enzymes doesn't change much. Hence, if you get any change in AST or ALT or hyperbilirubinemia, you have to be vigilant. And when you say hyperbilirubinemia, always look into the type of hyperbilirubinemia because that will tell you whether this is hemolytic or not. And when you look at the liver diseases in pregnancy, there are diseases which are specific to pregnancy. There are diseases which like health, which act as a part of multi-system involvement. There are diseases which get predisposed in pregnancy, which happens incidentally in pregnancy like hepatitis, or you have got pregnant uh, ladies, uh, becoming pre uh, ladies becoming pregnant with chronic liver disease. And if you ask me or any obstetrician, I think the first and foremost challenge they will say is, between AFLP and health syndrome. And when we as obstetricians always fret about differentiating between whether this is AFLP or health syndrome, our uh, medical counterparts always tells us why you want to differentiate between these two. Because anyway, your management is going to the same, you are going to terminate the pregnancy. So why you want to differentiate? Yes, I agree that uh, theoretically speaking or for uh, all the management purpose, there is not much difference. But when you, as, a, as uh, a doctor, when you are going to counsel that patient or the bystander, that makes a real uh, difference because just look at these two scenarios this was one these are all real scenarios this was a case which was referred as help to us but if you look at the bilirubin values and sgot values they are uh, they are not consistent with help syndrome and the platelet values are rather normal even though urine albumin is two plus and the renal function is going to change uh, fast and ptnr is also going to get elevated so even though this patient be terminated immediately, the patient continued to deteriorate and finally succumbed. Whereas this patient actually came a few years back to us at the middle of the night, as always happens with all these liver disease. She is a case of severe preeclampsia. And this was the first time I saw that typical polar colored urine. And can you imagine her LDH levels were 9,000. And just because of hemolysis, her hemoglobin had dropped to three. But this patient, in spite of having this much grave condition, she improved very well after delivery because this was a pure health syndrome. Whereas the earlier one, this could have been, we had ruled out hepatitis, but it could have been AFLP or it could be a mixture because in 20% of the cases, there is an overlap of AFLP and health syndrome might be due to some common pathology associated. So it's really difficult to differentiate. I agree that it is difficult to differentiate, but as an obstetrician, I would be happy if I could have a uh, knowledge whether in which path it is going to take because that will help me uh, how guarded prognosis I have to go, uh, go and give the bystanders. And to add to the mayhem, there, there are 
other conditions like TTP and HUS, which can also mimic these conditions. And because of lack of time, I won't be going into HUS and TTP. But if you look into this, uh, uh, this thing, you will see that health syndrome, the main thing you have to see is proteinuria and thrombocytopenia. Whereas for AFLP, bilirubin, liver enzyme abnormalities, and uh, hypoglycemia, and early uh, involvement of renal disease, you should make you think of AFLP. And these are the uh, factors which we consider as AFLP, that is resistant hypoglycemia, hyperammoninemia, higher bilirubin levels rather than uh, in HELP syndrome, more of renal involvement, and patient uh, goes into DIC much more faster. An ultrasound might help you, and people also say about liver biopsy, but nobody does just for diagnostic purpose. And uh, there is a criteria called as Swansea criteria to diagnose AFLP. If you, out of these parameters, if you have got six parameters are there, you can, if other, in the absence of other causes, you can diagnose it as AFLP. Uh, but what is more important than differentiating these two is, see in HELP syndrome, many a times what we have seen is that clinical features of HELP syndrome may precede the lab abnormalities by several hours or even several days. We had a patient who was in the, sec, uh, early, uh, I think 32 weeks chronic hypertension. She was always complaining of epigastric pain. We were investigating her. Her all investigations were normal, in, uh, but almost after 72 hours, she started to show biochemical abnormalities of health. So it is always prudent to go on repeating if you highly suspect it could be a health syndrome. Similarly, for AFLP, many a times these patients come with very non-specific symptoms like a uh, little bit of malaise, nausea, vomiting, there may or may not be associated high BP. So if a patient in third trimester complains of uh, unexplained malaise, you have to, it, it will be uh, better to think in terms of AFLP and ruling out that rather than just uh, thinking that this is a part and parcel of pregnancy. And as far as management is concerned, I think uh, it is easier to say than do. And we know that it should be a multidisciplinary approach. The maternal condition has to be stabilized. Hypoglycemia has to be corrected. The DAC has to be corrected. And the management is termination. As far as AFLP is concerned, there is no role for conservative management. But suppose the patient is below 34 weeks and it is a HELP syndrome, which is not drastically deteriorating. So people say that you might give 48 hours for the action of steroids. But what is more important is close monitoring in the postpartum period. Because many a times, immediately after delivery, we become complacent and we just uh, don't give that much follow-up. Uh, health syndrome usually will get uh, improved in the next 48 hours, whereas AFLP might take up to one week to improve, or it might further deteriorate and uh, go into acute liver failure. And for postgraduates who are hearing this, HELP syndrome has got some complement association also. Hence, people are uh, thinking about using monoclonal antibodies like eculizumab to treat HELP syndrome. And as far as AFLP is concerned, there is role for plasmapheresis. And ultimately, you might even have to resort to liver transplant. And as obstetrician, when we get a patient, especially who has got hypertension with a little bit of jaundice or uh, elevated liver enzymes, our uh, usual vision is a tunnel vision. And we only think about AFLP and health syndrome, but you have to think in terms of hepatitis also. When I say hepatitis, I don't mean viral hepatitis alone. You have to think about drug-induced hepatitis also, because one of the commonly used drugs by us, that is methyl dopa, is notorious to produce drug-induced toxicity. Uh, I think we had a patient who was in the uh, late second trimester towards 26, 28 weeks with gradually worsening uh, liver enzymes, and she was planning for termination outside. And when we uh, saw, we thought that only that liver enzyme part is worsening, others were not much changing. And we thought this could be a drug-induced one. And once we stopped methyl dopa, actually the patient improved. So just don't jump into terminating the pregnancy, always thinking that this is uh, help for AFLP. Think the probability of a drug-induced hepatitis also. And as far as viral hepatitis is concerned, this is the one condition where you are going to get very high transaminases. I think in obstetrics, the only other condition you might get this much high transaminases is intrahepatic cholestasis or obstetric cholestasis. But there again, the bilirubin levels will not be this high. And in viral hepatitis, you might have other added histories like fever, travel history, etc. And even though earlier we said differentiation between AFLP and health might not be much important, but differentiating uh, the viral hepatitis from them is very important because 
the management is ultimately conservative only because uh, the pregnancy is not going to worsen the viral hepatitis. So uh, there is no need to terminate the pregnancy till the acute phase of the disease is over. If you try to terminate the pregnancy unnecessarily, you might land up in trouble. And uh, if you're suspecting viral hepatitis, you have to send markers for hepatitis A, B, and E. And if uh, there is some uh, features suggestive of simplex, then that also has to be sent. And if you're very suspicious, you can even start acyclovir empirically. And hepatitis A has got some vertical transmission also. So if the mother delivers within two weeks of delivery uh, uh, within a hepatitis A, then the baby has to be given immunoglobulin. Other few conditions which we might miss is one is in the little bit of jaundice and little bit abnormalities in the liver enzymes in the first trimester. And this could be an association with high premises. If it is due to high premises, it will settle as and when the vomiting subsides and the liver enzymes will not be that elevated and the ultrasound will also be normal. But remember, just don't conclude that this is always due to high premises. Always keep in mind the probabilities of hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis and viral hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis and drug induced hepatitis. And another condition which is not very rare is intrahepatic cholestasis. We all know it comes with itching in the late second and third trimester with interactable itching. Many a times what happens is a near-term patient, when they complain of itching, uh, we think that this is just pruritus of pregnancy and write off some emollients and local applications and send them off. But before sending them off, always ask the million dollar question, whether your palms and soles are getting involved. Because if it is pruritus of pregnancy, the palms and soles will not be involved. There will be periumbilical sparing also. Hence, if palms and soles are involved, you have to evaluate this patient further. Along with that, you might have other symptoms like worsening at night, dark uh, urine, pale stools due to steatosis past history in the previous pregnancy they might have symptoms past history of unexplained IUDs might have happened she might give history of itching with intake of combined oral contraceptives so all these should make you think about this could be an IHCP and uh, we know the problem is the bile acid accumulating and it can produce fetal arrhythmias and sudden IUDs and when you evaluate again as I said earlier this is one condition where you might get very high values of AST and ALT but the bilirubin won't be that much elevated and the diagnosis is by serum bile acid and almost all the labs now uh, nowadays are providing with the serum bile acid so I urge all the obstetricians to make use of this investigation because this is going to be really helpful in making a diagnosis of IHCP. And if it is more than 10, it is considered as diagnostic and you have to keep them on very close monitoring. Once the value crosses 40 micromoles, then there is high fetal morbidity. And if you are very well suspecting a, a, a hepatic cholestasis, intrahepatic cholestasis, even without bile acid values, you are justified in starting ursodeoxycholic acid, which will give some symptomatic improvement. And... Um, if the patient is near term and the symptoms are very much suggestive of uh, intrahepatic cholestasis, uh, don't wait for the bile acid reports to come. You can think about terminating the pregnancy because if you wait for bile acid report to come, it might take some time and uh, in between the baby might become an IUD. And if you have got a bile acid value available, if the value is less than 40, you can wait up to 37 weeks. That's what the guidelines say. If the value is between 40 and 100, you have to terminate a little more earlier between 36 and 37 weeks. And if the value is more than 100, you might, you might terminate even earlier, especially if there is a past history of bad obstetric history. And always keep these differential diagnosis in your mind. And uh, coming to chronic liver diseases in pregnancy, I'm, uh, I'm sure that you are going to see more and more cases as the time goes on. And uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is on the increase. And the two important things that we usually come across is cirrhosis in pregnancy and chronic hepatitis B. Um, when it is a chronic liver disease, the most important part is the pre-pregnancy workup. And I think your gastroenterologist is going to help you very well in that workup. There are so many scores are available which will tell you whether this patient is going to have complications in pregnancy and whether this pregnancy is going to go up to term and what is the probability of having a live birth. So with the help of these scoring systems, you can decide whether the patient can conceive or not. If you feel that she needs some time and you need contraception, almost all long-acting reversible methods are okay if the liver function test is okay. 
But if the patient is in decompensated phase, the only thing that you might be able to use is copper T. And copper T is also contraindicated if there is thrombocytopenia and for obvious reasons if there is Wilson's disease. And combined oral contraceptives are okay if there is uh, your function test is normal, but these should be avoided if there is hepatic anoma. And cirrhosis, the problem in pregnancy is the, uh, when the blood volume increases and because of the compression of the inferior vena cava, the portal hypertension is going to break. Hence, the variceal bleeds are going to increase. So it, you should uh, have a gastroenterology consultation, especially in the second trimester, and do an endoscopy and see whether there is chance of high variceal bleed. And think about ligating or giving a prophylactic non-selective beta blocker. And for uh, portal hypertension, there are many uh, methods for many invasive methods. I am sure my uh, next speaker is going to elaborate on that. And ocleotide, which we have been using for non-pregnant patient, is contraindicated in pregnancy. As far as hepatitis B is concerned, our main concern is the mother to child transmission. If an adult gets infected with hepatitis B, the, uh, he or she becoming a chronic carrier stage is very less. But unlike that, if a neonate gets infected with hepatitis B, 90% of the time, that baby will become a chronic carrier. Hence, the baby has to be given immunoglobulin and vaccination immediately at birth. And the transmission from the mother to the baby depends upon whether E antigen is positive and the level of HBV DNA. So if you have got a hepatitis B mother with you, you have to send HB E antigen, E antibody. If E antibody is positive, you are happy because the infectivity is less, viral HBV DNA levels and LFT. And if HB antigen is positive, viral level is high or liver function is abnormal, you have to send them for a gastropenium. And um, if the HBV levels are high, they will be started on antivirals like tenofovir so that the transmission rate can be reduced. And otherwise, there is not much change in the obstetric management and there is no need to do a cesarean section just because it is hepatitis B positive. And gallstones, I think we are going to see more and more because the patients are elderly, they are obese, and luckily it can be easily diagnosed with ultrasound or endoscopic ultrasound. And uh, I, um, our next speaker is, a, uh, uh, is very famous in that field, so he will be elaborating about that. And, uh, but all the endoscopic procedures are safe in pregnancy. As far as cholecystitis is concerned, after acute appendicitis, this might be the second cause of acute abdomen. And again, it can be diagnosed easily with ultrasound. In the past, we thought cholecystitis has to be managed medically. But the, now the current trend is because if you are managing medically, the chance of recurrence is also very high. Hence, it is always better to go for surgical management unless the patient is almost near term where you can postpone it to postpartum. Um, another differential diagnosis that should be kept in mind is pancreatitis because of lack of time, I am not going into that. And I'm sure we are going to see more and more patients post liver transplant coming with pregnancy. And as for any uh, solid organ transplant, a two year window is good between pregnancy and the liver transplant. And almost all the immunosuppressants are okay with pregnancy like azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil might be contraindicated. And if you ask me what is the real challenge, I think the real challenge is the absence of teamwork. You should have a good rapport with your gastroenterologist. Many a times what happens is at eight o'clock in the morning, you will go to the ICU, see your patient, write your notes, counsel the bystanders and come off. Gastroenterologist will go separately at uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. He will see and he or she will talk to the bystanders. So uh, this combined rounds and combined counseling, both of you have to sing the same tune. That makes a long uh, difference in the management of the patient. So to conclude, hepatobiliary disease is a challenge both for the obstetrician and hepatologist. Making a diagnosis in the context of expected physiological changes is tricky. Your therapeutic decisions has got implications on the mother and the baby. Health and AFLP needs immediate termination. Always think about viral hepatitis and viral hepatitis has to be managed conservatively. Intrahepatic cholestasis is not rare. Always remember about palms and soles. High premises, drug toxicity has to be kept in mind. Chronic liver disease is on the rise. We obstetrician has to get familiarized with them. Gallstones and cholecystitis needs active intervention. And the two T's which are going to help you in the long run is time and T. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pramila. It was a very nice discussion. 
I think we will go to the, the gastroenterologist. Let us hear from him. And after that, we will have a discussion. Uh, or to Dr. Ashik Steno for the presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Pramila has actually made my life uh, very easy. She has covered most of the topics uh, which is there, and I agree 100%. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everybody if I can get a feedback. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Audible. So uh, I agree with uh, Madam in, in, absolutely in the last slide which she put up uh, to the T that time and teamwork is the most important factor in managing complex diseases, especially liver diseases in pregnancy. At the outset, uh, greetings from Muscat, and it's a pleasure and honor for me to be uh, to be invited to, to talk to all of you. And especially since uh, Perindalmanna and Perindalmanna Obstetrics and Gynecology Society, and I, I especially thank uh, Kunjumaydin sir, who was also my teacher when I was an intern in JIPMA. And we've had a special bond ever since. Uh, I really uh, thank each and every one for inviting me and greetings, uh, and I hope that I'll be able to clear out some of the cobwebs, uh, which is around uh, um, liver disease and pregnancy. Let me, uh, I actually plan to take you through uh, the topic in these uh, broad form, in broad topics, we'll look at the burden of the disease, and I will skip slides, which has already been covered by ma'am, and we'll look at the normal physiology, liver disease intrinsic to pregnancy, liver and biliary diseases complicating pregnancy, uh, involving most of the commonest chronic liver disease uh, issues, uh, treatment protocols. And as, a, as a, towards the end, we'll try and cover a little bit of inflammatory bowel disease in pregnancy, even though it's not strictly to the uh, uh, specific to the liver disease. So um, as mentioned before, all forms of liver disease complicating pregnancy has increased in prevalence over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, specifically in ASH, most of the pregnancies have 5.6 uh, to 12% having liver and biliary related issues. Uh, this slide has already been shown. Uh, most of the liver function tests remain stable uh, during pregnancy, except for albumin, which decreases alkaline phosphatase, increases and no specific changes in any of the uh, AST, ALT values or bilirubin values. Uh, gamma glutamyl transferase also remains stable. Uh, <clears throat> so looking at a basic workup, any pregnant woman with an abnormal liver function test, it's, it's an easy uh, cartoon to follow. Uh, you look at uh, whether the patient is having a hepatocellular profile or a biliary profile. So if there is an elevated bilirubin alkaline phosphatase predominantly with uh, normal AST, ALT values, uh, and if there is only an alkphos elevation, you reassure the patient with no further workup, unless the alkaline phosphatase is significantly elevated. There is no absolute values in literature, but we have seen mostly uh, 700 plus or 650 plus is significant, which you will actually corroborate with a gamma GT value, which would be normal if it is a placental alkaline phosphatase. While bilirubin plus alkphos elevation, you will still image the patient at least with a good ultrasound. If there is no evidence of obstruction, and if there is no uh, progression of the liver disease, you will keep the patient under close follow-up. While if there is a hepatocellular profile in AST, ALT elevation, you definitely uh, are uh, more vigilant and you try to rule out viral hepatitis. Uh, and as mentioned before, herpes uh, and hepatitis A, uh, hepatitis E, any other underlying chronic liver disease which was uh, never diagnosed before. This is a broad workup pattern for any patient with liver function abnormality during pregnancy. And coming, uh, once you have uh, uh, once you have made a diagnosis that there is a problem which needs to be evaluated, uh, how do you image the GI tract in pregnancy? And ultrasonography and MRI are the imaging techniques of choice for the pregnant patient. While, uh, uh, while the use of, uh, in MRI, most of the times, we don't require to use any IV contrast. Uh, just uh, either plain water and oral contrast would be fine. CT scan can be used if benefits outweigh the risks. And if you have a diagnostic confusion as to a significant liver pathology, oral contrasts are fine. IV contrast we use only if needed. Now, most of the nuclear scans are not required to make a diagnosis. Uh, and uh, radiation exposure risk, especially if you are planning an interventional procedure on ERCP in this patient is relatively safe. Anything less than five rad does not have significant fetal exposure. And most of the abdominal radiography, including uh, a series of barium swallows, barium enemas, or even multiple fluoroscopic sessions can be 
done without uh, significant fetal morbidity or mortality. Uh, we do not use transient elastography or uh, fibro scan in pregnant patients because it is still not recommended, even though studies are showing that it could be quite safe. Endoscopy, as mentioned before, ERCP, even liver biopsies, MRI, CTs, if indicated, can be safely performed with uh, the precautions which, uh, like shielding, if, uh, et cetera, if required. Coming to the liver diseases intrinsic to pregnancy, uh, nausea, vomiting of pregnancy, or hyperemesis gravidarum, intrahepatic cholestasis, HELP, and AFLP. Uh, hyperemesis gravidarum, it is mostly an obstetrician's domain rather than a gastroenterologist's domain, unless that is associated with a liver enzyme elevation, which can happen in up to 50 to 60% of cases. The first thing we do is to rule out if there is any other cause uh, after a good history uh, of the elevated liver function test. But if there is typical history, history of hyperemesis in previous pregnancy, uh, then we treat them as hyperemesis gravidarum. And our team here uses a, a puke score to actually grade them into mild, moderate, and severe. And uh, my job as a gastroenterologist, a part of the gynecology team, is to rule out any other causes. So we usually look at thyroid. We have seen patients with hypo as well as hyperthyroidism presenting with hyperemesis gravidarum. Uh, underlying hypercalcemia or, uh, uh, or other uh, intrinsic pathology in the liver, including AFLP and HELP, gastroenteritis infections, especially typhoid, migraine, uh, labyrinthitis, underlying sepsis, or uh, any obstructive pathology in the GI tract can present with mild alteration in liver function and significant vomiting. You need to have a, a, high thresh, I mean, a low threshold to, uh, to suspect these disorders and diagnose them. Uh, diet and behavioral modification forms uh, the, the most important part of management. Uh, you roll out other causes, correct hypovolemia, electrolyte, diselectrolytemia, and it can be treated with antihistaminics, antidopaminergic agents, steroids, antiserotoninic agents. This mostly is managed by the gynec or the obstetric team, and we do not have much of a role in this one. They are, uh, they are much, much better at uh, the pharmacotherapy of vomiting than us. And most of the time, the LFT liver function test normalizes once uh, vomiting settles down. And most of the liver function abnormalities are self-limiting. And by the time they enter into the 16th weeks of pregnancy. Coming to intrahepatic cholestasis, mostly uh, involving, uh, I mean, uh, mostly seen during the second and third trimesters with pruritus as a main symptom, mostly at night. Jaundice is relatively rare in these patients, even though up to four gram, four milligram per deciliter values are seen. Uh, we see a uh, um, SCPT, SUT elevation of between 200 to up to 700, and very rarely the supra uh, 1000 ranges, especially in patients who are significantly dehydrated or with uh, a level three or uh, severe hyperemesis, um, severe intrahepatic cholestasis. Most of the time, there is no synthetic defects. Prothrombin time INR is normal, albumin is normal, there is no other uh, system involvement. Uh, the, we always check the viral markers and do a simple ultrasound to rule out any obstruction. As uh, Madam mentioned before, serum bile acid forms the, the crux of diagnosis with a uh, value more than 10 millimoles, which is suggestive, and 40 millimoles considered high and with significant fetal morbidity. But there is more evidence coming up which shows that more than 100 millimoles is considered the threshold of action for a relatively earlier uh, termination of pregnancy. There are two uh, uh, recent very good trials which has looked at uh, around 12,000 pregnancies, and this threshold uh, would be introduced into most of the guidelines soon. The etiopathogenesis of intrahepatic cholestasis is predominantly in up to uh, it, it predominantly because of a synthetic defect of bile acids, which uh, makes it uh, accumulate intrahepatically in the hepatocytes producing pruritus. There are multiple muta mutations which have been identified in almost between 15 to 40% of patients, including the, the ABCB11 gene, the ABCB4 gene. All of them are uh, bile acid transporters, which transport bile acids from the hepatocytes into the bile and essentially excreting them out into the small bowel. Whenever there is a mutation, there is a higher chances of bile acid accumulation and inducing pruritus. 
liver biopsy is not normally performed in most of these patients, but if at all it is performed, you will see bland cholestasis or intrahepatic cholestasis. Significant maternal and fetal mor mor uh, morbidity, uh, 60 to 70 percent of them in maternal, the mothers would develop cholestasis in subsequent pregnancies. Oral contraceptive use because of the shared uh, hormonal profile can induce cholestasis. And of course, there is an increased risk of gallstone disease in these patients. And fetal morbidity, especially with uh, high bile acid values of more than 40 to 100 millimoles per liter, fetal hypoxia, meconium staining, prematurity, cardiac arrhythmias, which has been uh, found to be associated with high bile acid values, with a fetal demise almost uh, in line with the uh, concentration of bile acids in blood, with more than 100 micromoles per liter contributing almost 3.44% of fetal demise. Uh, while the difference between 0.13 at less than 40 and uh, 0.28 at 40 to 99, even though significant, does not come anywhere close to the more than 100 micromoles per liter values. Uh, the treatment, as mentioned, is arsodeoxycholic acid. Usually, we get we have a turnaround time for bile acid of 24 hours, so we'll be able to get the values before we start these in patients. Most of them tolerate the drug quite well. We started, uh, we aim at a target value of 15 milligram per kilogram per day. Uh, more, uh, some patients develop diarrhea with it. Other than that, this drug is quite well tolerated. LFT normalizes even uh, within uh, 10 to 15, 14 days of starting the medication. Uh, but uh, completely normalizes after delivery in most of the patients. Even though UDCA improves maternal outcomes and symptoms, the fetal outcomes, there, are, there is confusing evidence as to whether it really changes the fetal outcomes. The only thing which changes the fetal outcome is probably to deliver early if bile acid values are more than 100. UDCA acts predominantly through a choleritic action, even though it has got immunomodulation, anti-inflammatory, and anti-apoptotic actions, which also contribute to its therapeutic profile. We have significant evidence coming in from acetonosyl methionine, steroids, and rifampicin. There is a terrific study which goes on where uh, UDCA versus rifampicin in severe early onset intrahepatic cholestasis is ongoing, and the results are awaited probably by end of next year. Coming to the unholy trio, which is where you most of uh, as gastroenterologists, we get called on. Uh, the, co the combination of uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, HELP syndrome, preeclampsia. Most of them, uh, they form a spectrum uh, ranging from simple preeclampsia or proteinuria to alpha, uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy in various uh, combinations, permutations and combinations. Uh, the basic pathophysiology remaining uh, abnormal placentation and vasospasm. HELP syndrome is one of uh, the commonest uh, problems which you might face, occurring 0.1 to 0.2 percent of pregnancies and 10 to 20 percent of patients with preeclampsia. The pathogenesis being uh, chronic placental ischemia, platelet activation, consumption, complement cascade activation, and maternal immunogenicity to trophoblasts, occurs after 28 weeks in 70 percent and 30 percent of cases in early postpartum. So we are uh, a patient who has been delivered and who was recently delivered, presenting with uh, vague symptoms and altered liver function test. You need to be vigilant, as mentioned before, and keep them under follow-up with regular laboratory investigations and workup. Maternal mor mor morbidity is significant in HELP syndrome with DIC, abruptio placente, pulmonary edema, liver hematomas, uh, intraparenchymal bleeding, uh, and renal abnormalities. And the fetal morbidity also depends on the gestational eye age of presentation. Prematurity is common. IUGR, abruptio placenta, induced mortality with 7 to 20% as the range in perinatal mortality. This is quite a busy slide, but I, I felt that this would be easier uh, for us to discuss this. Basically, defective spiral artery modeling uh, with pro-inflammatory proteins being released into the maternal circulation systemic vasoconstriction, endothelial dysfunction, leading to liver injury, uh, vasospasm in the liver, microthrombi in the sinusoids, producing hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Uh, a short, I mean, acronym as HELP. So the workup would involve most of these patients present with uh, vague symptoms, abdominal pain, uh, either epigastric or right upper quadrant, almost 65%. Nausea vomiting, which can coexist uh, with the pregnancy-induced nausea vomiting, headache, 
uh, they can have uh, jaundice in almost 5% of cases. But uh, as mentioned uh, in, by the previous speaker, uh, uh, very vigilant attitude with uh, any patient, any pregnant person presenting with uh, vague right upper quadrant pain and altered liver function test should lead you to the diagnosis. We always do, other than the routine liver function test, a peripheral smear, coagulation panel, we cross-match the patient, a renal function test, and a good imaging with continuous monitoring regularly, even postpartum. There are two classification systems which are used, both Mississippi classification and Tennessee. Mississippi is a more commonly used classification system which grades help into class one, class two, and class three based on the ASTLT value. LDH value and platelet count. So the, the crucial points in diagnosis, a peripheral smear showing features of hemolysis, especially uh, if the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with schistocytes, teardrop cells, and an LDH value more than 600, uh, liver enzymes more than uh, two times of upper limit of normal, and platelet less than 100,000. Management, again, is uh, uh, the teamwork between the obstetric team and the gastroenterology team is extremely important. Your, if the patient has got underlying preeclampsia and is at risk for eclampsia, you administer magnesium sulfate, treat the hypertension. If the gestational age is below the limit of viability uh, or more than 34 weeks, if it is uh, less than, uh, if it, the gestational age is less than 34 weeks, you can deliver after maternal stabilization. If it is not, if any of the following is present, either fetal death, abruptio placenta, pulmonary edema, eclampsia, hepatic bleeding, stroke, then you, uh, uh, again, if any of these are present, you deliver after maternal stabilization. If the patient has got mild health, uh, if you need to wait for some time, if the gestational age is not suitable, then you can administer a course of steroids and deliver in 48 hours if the mother and fetus remain stable. The liver in help, is there a way we can prevent HELP syndrome? There is significant evidence for aspirin, which is uh, uh, which can, in, in up to an extent, help prevent help, uh, the liver abnormalities in HELP. More evidence is forthcoming, and we, we are waiting for more high-quality trials to, uh, to bring out their results. One important point is that liver function abnormalities may not correlate with the hepatic bleeding or any complications happening, so we have to be careful especially in patients with high ASTLT values or with any evidence of DIC. We always image the liver in, in patients, MRI and CT, if there is a suspicion of hepatic rupture, subcapsular bleed, which can happen in up to 0.9 to 1.5%. The surgeon is involved if there is a significant bleed. We have a very good interventional radiology team who would help us. We've had, uh, in the last five years, we've had three cases which we had to actually embolize the patient to control the bleed. Uh, blood product availability and platelet transfusion if the patient is hemodynamically uh, stable and if, if we are conserving the patient. Embolization if there is hemodynamic instability and in rare cases, surgery if, uh, or with uh, gel form packing if the uh, hemodynamic status is deteriorating and uh, interventional radiology workup is not effective. Very, very rarely only you would require liver transplantation. Most of the patients with help would uh, settle down with conservative management. But you have to be wary of recurrence in subsequent pregnancies. And also there is uh, significant evidence that there is increased cerebrovascular disease in this pregnant cohort. And they would have to be worked up, especially if it is an elderly pregnancy. Liver biopsy, again, not routinely performed, but if it is performed, this is what it would show, significant fibrin deposition, especially in the hepatic sinusoids, multiple pockets of hemorrhage, and liver injury pattern. The underlying, and this is a CT image which shows a, a collapsed liver parenchyma with features of parenchymal bleed and subcapsular hematoma. The pathophysiology behind the liver involvement in help is arteriolar constriction, probably because of the inflammatory cytokines, vascular endothelial damage, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, platelet deposition leading to thrombocytopenia, and fibrin deposition in the liver uh, venules leading to ischemia, necrosis, and hemorrhage. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy, uh, it is uh, occurring in around one in 7,000 to one in 15,000 pregnancies. 
typically at the third trimester, 80% pre-delivery and 20% in immediate postpartum, significant maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. Uh, this is uh, the underlying, one of the pathophysiological mechanism of AFLP is that there is a, a defect or a compensated defect in mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation in the fetus or in the mother. And this becomes more important because there is a relative energy switch during the late pregnancy where fatty acids are or fatty acid products are more present in the circulation, which leads to microvesicular steatosis and apoptosis, significant fat deposition, and acute liver failure or acute fatty liver in preg of pregnancy, associated with oxidative stress and inflammatory cytokines. Leading to uh, this picture, this is a perivenular, the central venous. Uh, area, the area around the central veins in the liver biopsy would show significant uh, steatosis with the portal tract being spared or having fibrin deposition. The Swansea criteria has already been mentioned. Uh, it's divided into clinical laboratory and radiographic features with more than six parameters requiring for uh, to help us clinch the diagnosis. One point I'd like to mention here is that an easy way to differentiate help in AFLP, it's never easy, it's always a spectrum. But AFLP is predominantly a synthetic defect, while HELP is predominantly uh, a liver injury. So you will have, uh, you will have synthetic uh, defect, which is uh, depicted on your laboratory evaluation in terms of hyperammonemia, significant coagulopathy, hypoglycemia, hyperuricemia, uh, DIC, et cetera, more commoner in, in acute fatty liver of pregnancy while associated uh, hypertension, uh, non-specific abnormalities, epigastric pain, uh, significant thrombocytopenia without DIC being more commoner in the HELP syndrome. And it HELP syndrome is more commonly associated with preeclampsia and hypertension than uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy. The workup is the first thing is to identify the cluster of symptoms. Rule out other causes of acute liver failure or acute liver, uh, fatty liver, of uh, acute uh, presentation, uh, such a presentation, especially viral hepatitis. Help has to be ruled out. Drug induced toxicity, as uh, Dr. Pramila had mentioned, especially with uh, herbal medications, alpha methyl dopa. Herbal medication is a problem which we feel here because there are very overindulgent mother in laws or friends who would uh, ask you to take all sorts of herbal medications. Uh, some of which we've had actually two cases which presented with acute liver injury during pregnancy, second trimester, and one of them uh, succumbed to the disease and uh, the other one we were able to get her to. Uh, as mentioned before, AFLP is a liver synthetic defect or liver failure rather than a liver injury. And management is multidisciplinary team meeting with, uh, we have, uh, like Madam mentioned before, we always have a combined uh, counseling of uh, the concerned patients' relatives, which so that everybody is on the same page, we all talk the same language, the same prognosis is explained rather than two different consultants saying two different things in, from two different angles. The obstetric part would be, uh, you know, would concentrate on the delivery and the associated problems, while the gastroenterologist would, would speak only about the liver. Instead of that, we have always a team meeting, <coughs> Sorry. followed by a counseling session, which I feel is more productive and actually, uh, it, uh, it is less confusion between the relatives, especially if there are multiple uh, bystanders or relatives to the patient. Of course, a rapid delivery becomes the most important factor, both for help as well as for uh, uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Uh, I have not uh, touched upon or concentrated upon the obstetric aspect because that was very well covered by the previous speaker. Uh, we always correct hypoglycemia if the blood glucose level is significantly low and try to maintain an average blood glucose level at 65 milligram per deciliter. We correct coagulopathy if, there is, if the, the INR is more than 1.6 or 1.8, but our threshold for blood transfusion, other transfusion are to maintain the hemoglobin more than seven, platelet count more than 50,000, and measure the fibrinogen and ma maintain the fibrinogen either with a cryoprecipitate or fresh frozen plasma to more than 300 milligram per deciliter. PTINR to be maintained at less than 1.5 to 1.6 times the controls. Almost all the parameters are measured eight to 12 hourly till they normalize and we keep the patient on follow-up 
at least till 10 days postpartum if they are stable. If there is worsening in liver function, these patients are considered as acute liver failure and managed ENSWISE. We always intimate the transplant uh, unit or transplant ready hospital nearby in case if there is a worsening scenario. There has been limited data on liver dialysis with the molecular absorption uh, systems and with plasma pheresis systems, uh, but the, the evidence is not robust uh, and the numbers are not high enough to, for us to reach a conclusion. Uh, if uh, the MEL score is calculated and if she becomes eligible for liver transplantation, then uh, if, if which happens only very rarely with uh, acute fatty liver uh, in less than 0.05 percentage of patients, but still that has to be considered and monitored as if we are dealing with an acute liver failure patient. The fetus and the mother has to be screened for uh, l chart def defect. Uh, <clears throat> with significant teamwork and management, mortality has reduced from 75% almost to 5%. With the perinatal mortality, depending upon the maternal complications and uh, time of delivery, or if uh, it is a preterm birth, the risk of recurrence in subsequent pregnancies with AFLP is always counseled, and further pregnancy should be closely monitored, especially if one of the parents or the child turn out to have the l chart mutation. <clears throat> Infants with a l chart deficiency can present with a metabolic crisis or suffer a sudden unexpected death at few months of age, so the, the infants has to be monitored very closely. The l chart enzyme is involved uh, in the fatty acid mitochondrial oxidation, and is considered as one of the pathogenetic uh, defect in uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy. <clears throat> now that we have covered in brief the intrinsic disorders of pregnancy or liver abnormalities in pregnancy, coming to the incidental uh, abnormalities which can present in any individual, uh, whether they're pregnant or not. One of the most common causes of jaundice in pregnancy is acute viral hepatitis, most common being hepatitis A. But the whole spectrum needs to be tested if anybody presents with uh, acute viral hepatitis. The typical liver function pattern being uh, very high AST ALT values, we usually see them above 1000. We test for hepatitis A, IgM hepatitis A, IgM hepatitis B, uh, and the uh, HCV, uh, IgM uh, hepatitis E virus, and herpes simplex. Hepatitis, most of them are self limiting, except for hepatitis E, which can have a more fulminant course with uh, certain series showing almost three to 5% ending up with fulminant hepatic failure, especially in pregnancy. Fetal maternal adverse outcomes are rare. Conservative management and symptom control is sufficient in most acute viral hepatitis. Acyclovir can be used in herpes simplex virus and close monitoring for liver failure in, in cases of hepatitis E virus and hepatitis A immunoglobulin in case of late trimester infection in unvaccinated uh, mother. While hepatitis B treatment is indicated, if otherwise treatment eligible, irrespective of whichever trimester she's at, in patients with cirrhosis or advanced fibrosis, they should be treated irrespective of the trimester. Tinafovir is the preferred treatment modality in pregnancy. And if patient was on treatment with endicavir, they're always shifted to tinafovir before the pregnancy. Continue tinafovir for at least four weeks after delivery if used for chemoprophylaxis which uh, reduces the incidence of maternal fetal transmission in almost 75% of the cases. Avoid invasive fetal monitoring, especially scalp, pH electrodes, et cetera. There is no uh, indication for cesarean section except for uh, obstetric indications. And uh, the infant hepatitis B surface antigen and anti-HPS after one to two months of the vaccine schedule. The most important point here is that the best prevention of perinatal transmission is diligent vaccination of the infant and hepatitis B immunoglobulin within 12 hours, which reduces the transmission in 90% of the cases. There is no contraindication to breastfeeding these uh, uh, infants, even if the mother is hepatitis B positive, whether she is on uh, treatment or not. The reason for uh, having uh, Chemoprophylaxis with tenofovir uh, at uh, the last or 28 weeks or the third trimester was that it, despite vaccination and hepatitis B immunoglobulin, there was a small cohort of infants which is turning positive, especially uh, this was detected in patients who had a high viral load of more than 
uh, 2 million international units or 10 raised to 6 lakh. So this meta-analysis uh, actually initiated this process of chemoprophylaxis with uh, tenofovir, which reduced the incidence of maternal to fetal transmission significantly, especially in patients with high viral load. So our approach is that we check, uh, uh, we have a very high prevalence of hepatitis B in Oman. All patients are checked at first trimester. Uh, if they're found to be positive, the family is also screened. They are look. I mean, they are assessed whether they are eligible for treatment without considering the pregnancy. The way to look at that is either if they are hepatitis B E antigen positive and the DNA is more than twenty thousand with altered LFT, or hepatitis B E antigen negative with HPV DNA more than two thousand international units with altered LFT, or significant fibrosis and on a fibro scan, which was done before, or underlying evidence of liver cirrhosis. In that case, we start treatment or shift them from endocava to tenofovir. If they're not eligible for treatment based on the initial evaluation, there is a recheck which is done at the third trimester or at 28 weeks. If the uh, HBV DNA PCR is more than uh, 2 million or 10 raised to six, they are uh, started on tenofovir, 300 milligrams, which is continued to either till the end of pregnancy or four weeks postpartum. At that point, you can decide to stop the treatment or if they are otherwise eligible to continue the treatment. Uh, of course, vaccination and hepatitis B immunoglobulin given to the infant becomes mandatory and the most important intervention. If they're less than the values, less than 2 million, we do not give tenofovir, we vaccinate the infant and administer hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Coming to hepatitis C and pregnancy, uh, the maternal to child transmission is only 5 to 10 percent. And can, um, you know, compare that to hepatitis B, where without intervention, it has always been around 75 to 90 percent. This is more commonly transmitted to the infant when there is a HIV co infection, prolonged rupture of membranes, very high viral load, or invasive procedures. The mode of delivery does not influence transmission, the genotype does not influence transmission, and breastfeeding is safe. Unfortunately, there is no vaccination, no immunoprophylaxis. There is no significant evidence on treatment, especially the treatment now for hepatitis C has completely shifted to uh, directly acting antivirals, and there is very little evidence on, uh, on the directly acting antivirals in pregnancy. So Ledipasvir, Sofosbuvir, or Valpatasvir, Sofosbuvir has been tried in isolated studies, but most of the patients uh, we screen and prefer to treat before pregnancy or after the pregnancy if it is stable. The child, the infant has to be monitored. The maternal antibody can remain in the blood almost up to 12 to 18 months. So we usually test them at six monthly intervals starting from six months, 12 months and 18 months. And if the anti-HCV is turning remaining positive at 18 months also, we do a HCV RNA PCR and treat the child if required. Gallstone disease in pregnancy, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, there is uh, a hyper uh, concentration and nidus formation because of the cholesterol abnormalities in pregnancy. And gallbladder sludge and stone occurs in almost 5% of pregnancies, while only 1.2% become symptomatic. And acute cholecystitis is the second most common non obstructive cause for surgery in these patients. There is no role for acid acid because the, uh, the, the evidence is does not uh, support its use regularly in pregnancy. If the gallbladder stones are asymptomatic, they need not be treated. While recurrent symptoms occur, if they become symptomatic in almost 92% to 44% of the patients in the first, second, and third trimester. So an intervention if required is safest during the second trimester Laparoscopic cholecystectomy can be safely performed and we do them regularly in our patients. We just make sure that the abdominal pressure is kept low uh, for obvious reasons. Biliary pancreatitis can happen in 1.2 to 3% of symptomatic untreated gallstones. Manage the same as a non-pregnant patient with hydration, uh, aggressive uh, dyslocalitemia correction, pain relief, etc. cetera. ERCP uh, because of cholidocolithiasis uh, occurs only in less than 2% of patients with gallbladder stones in pregnancy. Uh, we safely perform them regularly, and it is uh, predominantly preferred in second trimester. Left lateral position instead of the traditional prone position is what we use. 
and we make sure that the grounding pad for the cautery or the sphincterotomy cautery is kept at the back of the patient so that the, in, the uterus does not come between the instrument and the grounding pad. We limit our fluoro time and we limit the exposure to less than 10 and also the time for the procedure. An average radiation has been definitely less than uh, four milligray or 0.4 rad. Endoscopic ultrasound, as Dr. Pramila mentioned, is a very useful tool, tool, especially in late pregnancy where MRI becomes difficult or because of claustrophobia. Let me just demonstrate that with one of our own videos. This was a couple of years ago. This is a, a 38 year old uh, pregnant lady who has had a gallbladder stone, who has had cholecystectomy performed, but presented with right upper quadrant pain, uh, you know, fluctuating liver function abnormalities. Every other workup was negative. We ultimately, she was extremely claustrophobic. We ultimately uh, decided to do an endoscopic ultrasound. You can see the common bile duct calculus. She's had a lab coli almost 10 years before. And this was missed after that. The spontaneous CBD stones are not very common. The stone must have been uh, missed after the uh, follow-up of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So this was removed in the same sitting at the ERCP. So EUS uh, forms a very important modality in, 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 in evaluating uh, biliary abnormalities in pregnancy. So this is an ARCP, which uh, is happening immediately after the endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, so uh, this is uh, in the left lateral position. And as mentioned before, uh, we always shield the uterus with the lead shield and uh, limit our fluorotype. So yeah, endoscopic ultrasound is safe in pregnancy and ERCP also can be safely performed in pregnancy in safe hands and is a very valuable tool to any gastroenterologist dealing with pregnant patients. You can see the stone there. Coming to NASH in pregnancy, one of the most common liver function, abnorm liver abnormalities, or what the, the commonest cause of liver cirrhosis now. Uh, in childbearing age, even pregnant, uh, in women in childbearing age, 10% of them are found to have non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis or fatty liver disease. Uh, hepatic manifestation. This is basically hepatic manifestation of metabolic syndrome. They are more prone to develop gestational diabetes and increase odds of preeclampsia, cesarean section with uh, some uh, fe uh, fetal morbidity as well. Plan an ideal body weight and optimization of NAFLD before pregnancy. And as far as possible, statins are contraindicated in pregnancy, even though there is some evidence that it, it can be used in certain cases. But we avoid statins as a principle uh, in, in our unit and, and during pregnancy. It is a, uh, this is a metabolic syndrome and has to be managed as such with lifestyle modification and optimization of the parameters before uh, uh, getting pregnant or planning a pregnancy. Coming to the other uh, less common uh, chronic liver disease which may present in pregnancy, autoimmune hepatitis, again, quite common in the childbearing age, but uh, uh, it can be managed very well during pregnancy. There can be a chances of flare in up to three to eight percentage of cases with fetal adverse outcomes also reported. Most of them can be managed with the same medications they are on. The traditional medicines used for uh, autoimmune hepatitis are steroids and azathioprine which can be safely continued with a diligent monitoring of flares and management uh, of them if required. Primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis, they are all the only drug which is found to be effective other than liver transplantation is arsobioxycholic acid, which can be continued throughout pregnancy. If a PBC or PSE is, uh, especially primary sclerosing cholangitis, we have quite a high incidence of those as well. So we make sure that if they are planning pregnancy, we do an MRI abdomen with MRCP. If there is a dominant stricture which needs to be corrected, we correct that with an ERCP before uh, they are planning pregnancy. Liver cirrhosis, uh, also mentioned previously, a higher risk of variceal bleed, more in the second trimester. So we always plan an endoscopy in the second trimester if it was not cleared before pregnancy. And, and if your endoscopy was not performed before pregnancy and diagnosed as very small varices, an elective endoscopy in second trimester, if there are large varices with red color signs, we prefer to ban them. And beta blockers are usually started only after the pregnancy. Our, our gynecology team prefers it, even though there is evidence that non-selective beta blockers are safe in pregnancy. Liver, liver transplantation, uh, the 
the fertility uh, returns quite fast, especially after liver transplantation. There are a significant number of young, of, uh, preg uh, young, young females in the reproductive age group undergoing liver transplant for various reasons. Uh, most of them continue. We ask them to give at least uh, a two-year gap or two or three years gap before uh, planned pregnancy is uh, endured upon. And most of the immunosuppressants can be continued except mycophenolate morphotil because of the teratogenicity and fetal effects. Wound healing may be uh, delayed in patients with uh, serolimus or iverolimus, but this is something which can be, which does not actually uh, interfere with pregnancy except uh, they're undergoing a cesarean section. And close monitoring by a transplant hepatologist is required. Uh, just uh, done with the liver disease in pregnancy. Let me just take you through just a few slides on IBD in pregnancy. I'm going to skip for want of time. So any patient with inflammatory bowel disease, either it is Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, we ask them to plan their pregnancy to have at least a three-month steroid-free remission prior to conception, especially if they've had severe disease. We get them up to date on all of their vaccines. And we try to limit them to the minimum uh, medications possible. We taper off all pain medications. And uh, of course, a, a prenatal vitamins are started, especially the folic acid is given at two milligrams if they are on sulfur salicin. Uh, adequate nutrition maintenance. And uh, we work them up towards optimization of the nutritional parameters, especially if the patient is having an ileostomy or a colostomy of methotrexate is contraindicated in pregnancy and it has to be stopped. All other drugs are relatively safe, especially mesalamine, sulfasalacine, uh, azathioprine, and the newer biologicals. But biological has to be closely monitored with regular serum drug level measurement. Tofacitinib or Zelgians, uh, the evidence in pregnancy is not robust, so we prefer to avoid it. In patients who are in remission, Regular follow-up is uh, once every three months with labs every trimester, uh, routine antipartum care, uh, fetal growth ultrasound in trimester three. If there is significant perineal disease or evidence of active disease in the perianal area or history of uh, rectovaginal fistula, we prefer them to have a cesarean section, but otherwise uh, it is an obstetric indication whether it's a normal delivery or cesarean section. Flares are managed as flares. Uh, and uh, if they require to be on steroids for a particular flare, uh, we do not hesitate to put them on that. At the time of delivery, uh, our team usually does uh, a streptococcus screening at 35 weeks. Like mentioned before, prior rectovaginal fistula or significant perineal disease, we recommend cesarean. But even if there is an ileal pouch or if there is an absent perineal disease, normal vaginal delivery can be given and cesarean section is only reserved for uh, obstetric indications. We make sure if most of them undergoing delivery, if they are uh, bed bound, we always give them postpartum venous thromboembolism prophylaxis as IBD is a procoagulant state. Um, so just summarizing the IBD, most of the drugs are safe except for uh, methotrexate, which is contraindicated and Zelgens or tofacitinib on which we are awaiting more evidence. Just a quick uh, a point where we feel that as gastroenterologists, we work very closely together with our infertility specialists. PCOD and infertility where uh, weight loss is a significant uh, requirement for, uh, for an effective or successful uh, pregnancy outcome. Lots of them are morbidly obese and would require some sort of help and uh, pre-pregnancy, uh, a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, lots of them are hesitant, especially in the younger age group. So we have uh, an efficient modality where we, we uh, help our uh, gynecology colleagues. We have an audit which was done. I'll share the uh, results with you. These are gastric balloons of various types. We started doing them right from 2011. And uh, we do it for uh, on request from our uh, GI and infertility, I mean, our gynecology and infertility team. Uh, we do it for a lot of our patients undergoing uh, who require weight loss as part of their infertility treatment. And uh, this can be, this is very from six months to one year to one and a half years. And we've had excellent results and excellent pregnancy outcomes with, uh, and with significant weight loss in PCOD patients uh, who have been followed up for infertility.
This is a simple endoscopic procedure. Can be endoscopically inserted and endoscopically removed with minimal uh, minimal problems, except for vomiting in the first few weeks. And uh, this is also an endoscopic modality where uh, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. This is an endoscopic version of uh, sleeve gastrectomy, where uh, we create a, a application of the stomach endoscopically. And we are in, uh, right now we are recruiting patients for uh, uh, an audit which we are doing. Uh, we've done almost 18 of these cases. Three of them were actually in, in childbearing age group uh, for primary PCOD. Uh, we've had efficient results of around 25 to 30 kilogram weight loss in the first one year out of this, uh, this thing. This is also an endoscopic minimally invasive modality for weight loss and which can be used in patients with infertility and PCOD. So we've had 82 patients in our audit so far with an average BMI of 34 aged between 22 and 30 years. Most of them were primary infertility, advised weight loss of around 20 kilograms. And the balloons, uh, we had an average weight loss of 21.7 and a successful pregnancy in 59 out of those 82 patients. So 71.9% success rate with a simple reversible intervention in patients who do not respond to the normal simple lifestyle modifications. Just I'm leaving it out here just as a food for thought. So uh, I know that I've offshored my time a little bit, uh, but thank you very much for patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Ashik Sainu, for the nice presentation. And I think uh, now both of you can give some tips to us or diagnosis of jaundice in pregnancy. The common conditions like uh, uh, AFLP, hepatitis, intrahepatic cholestasis. What are the important points we are doing? Just few sure. points. In, in my opinion, it is, uh, you know, uh, the first, uh, because the, uh, any pregnant patient will come to the obstetrician gynecologist first. So, uh, you know, uh, like what uh, Dr. Pramila mentioned, uh, uh, a very inquisitive mind uh, and attention to detail, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, uh, just vague complaints are not ignored, especially in, in the right patients and working them up and an early referral in case of any doubt. Like in, gen in short, a teamwork to diagnose the patient and to give the best outcomes is the, the extremely important. Uh, and uh, if you go, it, see, the uh, liver diseases in pregnancy has not changed since time immemorial. Uh, the, we've had a, this, you know, something presence in the first trimester. We have uh, hyperemesis gravidarum in first trimester and second trimester onwards, either in hepatic cholestasis, which is which presents with prorates, easy to diagnose and settles down easily with the UDCA. The real confusion is between uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy and help. And like what ma'am mentioned, the, the treatment may remain the same, but the uh, extent of care which you would give to AFLP would be very different from that you would give to help because the, the morbidity and mortality are higher. And like mentioned before, you need to just think about liver injury in health. So you will have a predominant hepatotoxic pattern, thrombocytopenia and hemolysis, while the other one actually presents as liver failure. You will have uh, coagulopathy, you will have hyperammonemia, the patient is sicker, and uh, it takes time for the liver function abnormality to settle down. So if you actually take a very careful history and work them up, it can be uh, reasonably differentiated I'm sorry, in most of the patients. What about Pramila? I think I almost covered all the points in my presentation, but I think uh, one point I would like to add, I already said it in my presentation, is look at the type of bilirubin that is elevated uh, because that will help you to some extent in finding out whether this could be a hemolytic picture or something else, whether you have to think about if, if your conjugated bilirubin is getting increased. So that, that might help you. And as I said, uh, that keeping in that diagnosis, uh, your eyes don't see what your mind uh, doesn't think. So keeping that in mind and uh, looking for it, that's the most important thing. Whenever a patient uh, or pregnant patients comes with all sorts of complaints, but uh, many a times we just uh, say that all oh, these are all part and parcel of your pregnancy. Uh, better than leaving it alone, be a little proactive. Even if you do an extra investigation and it turns out that it is uh, normal, 
it's okay rather than missing a diagnosis and uh, ending up in a grave maternal uh, morbidity it is always uh, better to uh, or a little be more proactive and over investigate i think and uh, yes, uh, uh, coagulopathy and uh, coagulopathy hyperglycemia hyperammonemia yeah these three uh, things the coagulopathy is one of the important thing no yes hyperglycemia and hyper yeah. hyperammonemia if you have a good lab these three parameters would actually help you differentiate of course hemolysis is more commonly seen in health so but you know with a with a dic pattern which happens you, you can have bilirubin going up and down in this thing yes even there's a very good pointer but if you you know these are the other three things which i mentioned these are synthetic defects when liver is actually failing the other one is an injury where you know you are having uh, flares here and there but uh, mostly the patient is less sick so these three points is what i keep in mind when when i am diagnosing predominantly an aflp rather than health okay so some tips from the dr pramila about the in delivery in the aflp how to deliver is it is cesarean section or vaginal delivery so um the uh, thing is you have to deliver them fast okay and uh, there is not much time to waste but there is no strict indication that you should do a cesarean section you if you think that she is a multi gravida she is very favorable cervix near term patient and with just with a little bit of oxytocin if she can deliver well and good but don't waste your time in making uh, uh, her deliver vaginally because by losing time uh you might actually uh, increase the complications of the mother and she might further go into dic more and more and by that time uh, doing even a cesarean section might become very difficult mode of induction mode of induction uh, if uh, i think uh, it should be favorable cervix with oxytocin Uh, there, uh, if you think about yes. going for um, uh, foley's and ec and pg no one time. it takes okay. lot of time there is no time to waste for that <laughs> And if you want to do a cesarean section, what incision would you would you like to prefer? A vertical that incision depends or upon, a front? That depends upon the current coagulation status of the patient. If the patient is uh, not in coagulation failure as of now, uh, and uh, preferably if it is the if you are very sure it is a HELP syndrome and it's not an AFLP which is going to further deteriorate, I might even give, go with a transverse incision. But if the patient is in coagulation failure, 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 or if you think that it might uh, it might be a A A FLP also it might further deteriorate. It might be always better to put it uh, midline vertical, yeah, vertical, yeah, and in also line. close with a uh, drain in situ, okay, yeah. so that yeah, you can always look for any further uh, bleeding happening. Oh, okay. There are some questions uh, from the 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 chat box. Uh, can alcohol use in pregnancy aggravate cholestasis? <laughs> Doctor Ashik can. <laughs> yes uh, no not only not necessarily cholestasis uh, it can aggravate any liver function abnormalities but uh, uh, see uh, alcohol use in that something even very seasoned uh, alcohol consumers uh, they, they stop drinking in pregnancy that's something <laughs> found i mean they don't harm their fetus any any specific diet to be followed in aflp a specific diet sir there is no time for all these things no diet so there is no time for any diet on that one possibility of sudden fetal demise in liver disease with pregnancy that is another question again that mentioned no yeah help in aflp definitely have a cholestasis with a yeah. very high bilirubin level bile acid level bile acid bile acid levels and another question to dr uh, premila is g3a2 with previous two pregnancy loss following acute fatty liver of pregnancy what is the probability in the current pregnancy and how to prevent it <laughs> uh the chances of recurrence is very high uh, but i don't think there is anything we can do to prevent it it all depends upon the uh, genetic factor of that baby if luckily for her if that baby is actually uh, is not deficient in l chart she might uh, come out with an uh, normal one if the baby is uh, this baby is also l chart deficient uh, then uh, it's going to be again <laughs> going into uh, what about this l chart deficiency babies uh, uh, any uh, how is the prognosis of these babies they don't i think, have... um i'm not very sure but what i have read from the literature is these babies has to be followed up because they are deficient their fatty acid metabolism can be abnormal so these babies has to be followed up so, yeah, i think even a special diet is recommended to... isn't it yeah. special diet yeah, is they they have a specific diet uh, the thing here what we do for such so, so the that actually is uh, outside the purview of a normal uh, git what we, we we have a metabolic center we actually send them there 
So we have a metabolic center. There are, we have a geneticist and a metabolic uh, disorder specialist who follow them up. Yes, they have a special diet, which is, uh, you know, fatty acid deficient, and they need to be regularly followed up. They, they have got problems which will develop in the immediate period, in the postpartum period, or uh, as young uh, adults, uh, and they would have to be regularly followed up. Yes. Another question to Dr. Ashik is, um, are vaccines for hepatitis safe in pregnancy? Yes, they are. Most of them, hepatitis B and hepatitis A can be given in pregnancy. Uh, the safety profile is proven. Hepatitis B vaccination can be given. There are different types of hepatitis B vaccines, out of which Engerix B, which is the recombinant vaccine, is the most commonly used. That can be very safely given in pregnancy. Another question to Dr. Pramila is, can we give prostaglandins for PPS in these cases? In AFLP, can, can we use eh? yes. prostaglandins? Ah, prostaglandins can be used. It's not going to produce hepatic abnormality. Uh, it's not going to interfere with your hepatic function. You can give prostaglandins. These are the questions. Uh, any comments from Dr. Kunyumudi? <clears throat> One of the common uh, things the pregnant patients complain is constant itching. So that is one thing we should not ignore, not the jaundice, not the tiredness or vomiting or anything. But this, uh, especially the itching in the, uh, the palms and under the soul, all those things actually we have to, like Dr. Pramila told, we have to think about it and we have to investigate. And that is one thing, very often the obstetricians give some uh, anti-itching uh, uh, agents or some lotions and uh, ignore them, and they'll end up in much more trouble later on. And that is one very common thing which we very often ignore. No, I just wanted to ask Dr. Pramila also, because usually what we use or we have seen our uh, gynecology counterparts use is, uh, you know, chlorpheniramine malleate and calamine lotion with UDCA is what they commonly use or Atrax or hydroxyacin is used. Is there any other tricks which you use to control the pruritus for my uh, own? Education? If it is just pruritus of pregnancy, I think steroid ointments are going to be helpful. So that okay. can be used. And uh, emo other emollients like liquid paraffin, that's what we call our dermatology people likes to use uh, this liquid paraffin that rather than uh, calamine, we have found that using liquid paraffin gives them much more uh, good results. And then okay. steroid ointments can also be used. Okay. See, another one thing which we tell them, especially with intrahepatic cholestasis, is that this was actually, uh, see, I, I don't know the evidence of it. You know the neem leaves, which we find, the neem leaves, which, you know, Ayurveda mm -hmm. The same thing, that they, uh, you know, I've had a, a lot of Omani uh, gynecologists uh, suggest, ask them to fill the bathtub with warm water and put uh, these leaves into it and take a shower in that. And apparently it works wonders. I, I don't know what is the evidence uh, behind it, but it, lo lots of them have said that it's very useful. There and might be some role yeah. because uh, when we get, when we as children when we get chicken pox that's yeah. the one which we used to uh, yeah. <laughs> rub our body okay. yeah. that gives us good relief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess I've had almost all patients. You give them UDC, they say, "Doctor, it's itching, itching, itching." No, 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 they, no. It's only if they, if you are suspecting IHCP, we are giving UDCA, not for just pruritus of pregnancy. And uh, Ashi, can you once again just uh, highlight or summarize the use of uh, esophageal ultrasound? In pregnancy. Yeah. Just one, two, three, what and point? So endoscopic ultrasound. See, mo most of the times, even though we will say, because gallbladder stones here in this part of the country, we have that, I mean, it's extremely common. Almost 70% of our ERCP work uh, is uh, in, in some in somehow related to pregnancy and the gallstone related with be within the first few six months, etc. So uh, we use endoscopic ultrasound significantly because lots of times they will go for an MRI. Uh, if the patient is having, uh, you know, gallstones and there is altered liver function test, they'll go, ultrasound will say uh, pregnancy, gases, lower CBD cannot be assessed, correlate clinically. We'll send them for an MRI. Two things, open, the open MRI does not have, lots of times it's a 0.5 Tesla MRI, lots of times they'll tell you the you know, lower CBD cannot be assessed, query narrowing, query sludge. The other MRI, most of the pregnant women are claustrophobic. They cannot, once they're in the second trimester, they cannot get into it and they feel very claustrophobic. So we have found that most of our these things, we don't even send them for MRI now. We put in the endosc endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, it takes exactly 10 minutes. Uh, so there are two stations which we will image from. So it, this is an ultrasound probe at the tip of the endoscope, uh, which, uh, which, which actually you can have different frequencies. 
we image from the G junction, looking at the left lobe of, I mean, left lo uh, the left lobe of liver, and uh, we can image the portal vein and the common bile duct right from the G junction and from the duodenal station. Then you pass the endoscope into the D1 and image the common bile duct from there. So the, if the sensitivity is almost 95 to 98%. We can pick up a, a common bile duct stone. If it is minimal sludge and uh, you know there is no uh, acoustic shadowing on the common bile duct, I don't take them up for an ERCP because you develop a pancreatitis with ERCP in pregnancy, it's mess. It's a mess. I mean, the patient would... Uh, so EOS actually gives us a very clear idea. So much so that even if an MRI says there is a stone there, microlith there or 2mm stone there, before we do an ERCP, invariably we put in an endoscopic ultrasound scope. It just adds 10 minutes to our work, but it, it uh, almost 20% of the ERCPs which are scheduled can be avoided if you do an EOS before that. And you can avoid the complication in a lot of the uh, patients because two to five percent of ERCP patients will develop pancreatitis, and managing a pancreatitis in pregnancy is is horrendous. I mean, you can't give them adequate, uh, you know, pain relief. Usually, we give them if if it's a normal biliary pancreatitis, they are on uh, remifentanil and uh, midazolam infusions, which may, it, in pregnancy I can't uh, do that. And the amount of fluids which you can put in, and most of the times they are. They're not in a, you know, with pain, they cannot be comfortable. They're not restful. They don't get enough sleep. So I try to avoid a post-ERCP pancreatitis as much as possible. And EOS is quite a helpful modality. for that. So with 95 to 98% sensitivity and more than 85% specificity, I would say I, I, I don't send patients for MRI anymore. If we can, if they can afford it, we, we do an EOS. And it's almost, almost the same price as a MRI. And uh, do we have access for endoscopic ultrasound, Dr. Ajit and uh, Dr. Premila, in your institutions? Yes, in Amala, we have got um, endoscopic ultrasound is available and uh, ERCP, MRCP all are being done by our gastro department. Amala gastro department uh, is has started off doing this. Yeah, yeah Dr. how Sojan. costly endoscopic ultrasound in your institution? US, how much it costs? Uh, I'm not sure, sir. I'll have to find out. Oh, I don't know. Cost, anyway, diagnostic US in India is around 25, between 15,000 to 25,000, if it is diagnostic, rupees. Oh. Uh, if you have to do an FNAC or do anything through that, then um, accordingly. But uh, ERCP would be around, I think, in presently in Kerala, it's between 35,000 to 50,000. That is what I understand. Can we wind up, Dr. Ajit? I think, I think we can wind up now. It was a very yeah. nice discussion. <laughs> yeah, it was a very <laughs> Thank you, sir. Useful. Yeah, and yeah. on behalf of uh, Pirindalmano NG Society, I express uh, our sincere thanks to Dr. Ajit, who is the president of Kerala Foundation, who has uh, agreed, readily agreed to come and uh, inaugurate and moderate this session, which is the first of his uh, activity as the president of KFOG. And, uh, the Pendulumana Society is very much uh, proud to host you as the chief guest. And uh, we are very happy to have Dr. Ashit. Uh, uh, in fact, the, uh, who, uh, who is very close to us at the same time, an international faculty also. And uh, we are very happy to have you, uh, have your discussion, have your talk, uh, which was very, uh, very much useful for us uh, to know about the current uh, thinking in gastroenterology and uh, liver disease complicating pregnancy. And uh, Dr. Premila did a very wonderful job uh, explaining uh, all the dilemmas. And uh, in fact, I felt after the discussion, she doesn't have much dilemma I felt. And uh, <laughs> in fact, she expressed everything in detail and uh, made the discussion very lively. And uh, in fact, see, because this is one topic which is uh, not very commonly being discussed in our conferences and in our meetings. So I thought, uh, see, these are the rare things which we should know because uh, the even all the obstructions come across and because they are not aware about, about the current updates, they just do what they uh, know right from the their post-graduation days and just uh, push off with that and land up in troubles. So I hope this will be an eye opener for all the delegates who are attending and very happy to say that, uh, see, Right from the beginning, there is a very good attendance uh, of around 190 plus, and that is still continuing uh, taking active uh, sending questions. Again, questions are keep on coming. 
so uh, but many are the reputations so thank you all thank you so much thank you dr thank you dr ashik thank you dr Pramila. last one, one, one thing uh Mary, sir one thing i just wanted to ask you do you for your pcod and infertility do you uh, for weight loss do you use anything or not no no weight, weight loss in fact to see the weight loss is actually a dilemma <laughs> so in the sense <laughs> however you stay they will not reduce the weight and uh, see there is a lot of uh, things misunderstandings and uh, they do not want to go for any bariatric surgeries and uh, there are a lot of uh, controversies regarding the malabsorption following bari bariatric surgery and the ones when they achieve pregnancy so in general personally i just advise some two or three times they ask them to go for uh, this uh, gym and all those things <laughs> whether they reduce weight or they do not reduce weight if they not become pregnant i'll do ivf so that is uh, <laughs> and and the ivf one thing is that these pco patients they just for so many eggs they will have a lot of embryos so the cumulative pregnancy rate is very good because we'll have some uh, embryos for transferring on three or four occasions so at least one of these transfers they will catch the fan so uh, so that is the current uh, practice now and after hearing your uh, this uh, endoscopic thing i think uh, more patients may be willing because bariatric they think that they the surgeon can just come out no, cut that what thing. what we are doing we are getting actually patients from qatar and all the other rest of the gcc because we are the cheapest in gcc with regards yeah. to pelut and the response is but <laughs> since it's not a surgery people are so actually this thought came to me because dr ashraf started referring some patients Yes. So then only we started doing it. You know, I, otherwise, I never thought of that as a uh, as an indication for this one old thing. But it's quite effective. But uh, laparoscopic bariatric uh, surgery, a few patients are doing. Uh, but uh, in fact, they're not so happy with their uh, post bariatric uh, performance with regard to the uh, hormonal uh, status as well as the and uh, the embryo qualities are not so good. So a lot of things we have to study. A lot of things uh, following this uh, bariatric things. If the patients uh, once if they land up for IVO. Thank you. The learning experience for me also. Thank you very much. Thank you all. See you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pramila. Yes.